All right, folks, so we're gonna be talking about foraging for wild mushrooms, where to look for wild mushrooms, and a little bit about identifying wild mushrooms. Um, so whenever I go foraging, I kind of think that I'm foraging for health. Um, the act of foraging mushrooms in itself is a powerful medicine. You get great cardio, beneficial inoculations from soil microorganisms, um, better understanding of your local topography, and better understanding of natural patterns. Um, wild mushrooms also contain compounds that are effective against local pathogens. Fungi being more closely related to uh, animals than plants are oftentimes facing the same um, environmental um, uh, disturbances, the same viruses, the same bacteria um, that might be detrimental to us. And they're actively creating compounds um, like antivirals, antimicrobial compounds that can be beneficial for animals and for humans. Um, so on the top left here, we have some armillaria mushrooms. These are honey mushrooms, a parasitic fungus. Um, armillaria is actually toted with being um, the largest and oldest organism on the planet. In uh, Oregon, there's a specific uh, armillaria that is uh, miles and miles long. It's been uh, basically eating uh, forests there. Um, so this is a mushroom that um, eats trees while they're alive and kills them and then continues to grow. Um, um, on these trees. So this is the Armillaria tibescens, the uh, ringless honey mushroom. It is edible. Uh, it's delicious edible. I don't recommend harvesting and taking these mushrooms very far from where you found them as they, uh, the spores can potentially um, inoculate and uh, be detrimental to another tree. Um, on the top right, uh, we have the maitake mushrooms and I'll talk a little bit more about these as we go on. Uh, maitake grow in the fall. Uh, typically around the base of oak trees. Um, they are a beautiful um, edible mushroom, um, also recognized for its medicinal compounds, um, mostly the defraction beta-glucan or polysaccharide. Um, and uh, this, this is one that can be cultivated, but um, it is a little bit tricky to cultivate um, at, at scale. Um, on the bottom left, we have the chicken of the woods. Um, there are people that are starting to develop cultivation techniques for them, but they aren't sharing them readily. Um, so this is something we might look to see uh, more cultivation techniques in the next five to ten years. Um, the one that I'm holding in the bottom left is Lady Porus uh, sulfurius. Um, there are about three or four different varieties in the United States, but typically in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, we're going to be finding the Lady Porus sulfurius and the Lady Porus uh, cincinnatus. Um, on the bottom right, we have uh, uh, Sparacis spatulata. Um, this is known as a cauliflower mushroom. Um, this mushroom has been cultivated in Asian countries, so there is possibility for it to be cultivated. Um, I haven't experimented with cultivating this mushroom, but it is de definitely something that I look forward to and definitely something that I'm very interested um, in working with. Um, this mushroom is uh, very delicious, and the Sparacis mushroom actu actually contains compounds that can uh, be effective at fighting off the armillaria mushroom which is on the top left um, if you are, are noticing that you're having issues with your trees uh, being killed by armillaria mushrooms. Here we have Caprinus comatus. This is a uh, excellent candidate for cultivation. Um, it isn't one that you're going to really want to be marketing um, and selling at farmers markets or restaurants or anything like that um, because this mushroom um, never evolved to open its cap fully. Um, so because of this, it did evolve um, an interesting trait uh, where it has an auto digestion. Um, so this mushroom
with techniques that you'll learn throughout the course. Um, on the top left, we have the birch polypore, which isn't really known for um, uh, cultivation. Um, it's found on birch trees, uh, white bottoms, brown top. Um, Latin name is Fomis betulina. Uh, it used to be Piptoporus, so I would call this my Piptoporis. Um, but mushroom uh, names change often due to DNA sequencing. Um, as we do DNA sequencing on mushrooms, we're finding out that there are more varieties that we have been commonly um, um, identifying as the same thing. Um, right next to that, we have um, the Agaricus campestris. Um, this is the wild cousin of the button mushroom that we'll find in the stores. This mushroom was brought to the U.S. by European cattle, um, and we find this a lot in old uh, cow uh, fields um, where I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, delicious edible mushroom. There are other agaricus that can make you sick, um, so there are certain things to note, uh, like these pink gills underneath, um, nice brown spore print. The gills will turn brown as it matures. Um, on the right we have more maitake, and again I'll get into that. Um, it's just one of my favorite mushrooms, so you might see it a couple times throughout these slides. Um, on the bottom right, uh, we have shrimp of the woods. Um, this is a parasite on a parasite. So this mushroom parasitizes the honey mushrooms um, and creates this um, beautiful shrimp-like texture, um, delicious wild mushroom. Here we have chaga. Um, this is a part of a fungus, but it is um, not a mushroom. It doesn't produce any spores or anything like that. Um, it's a sterile conch. Um, and this is toted to be the highest antioxidant value of any um, organism on the planet. Um, so a lot of people will use this for its antioxidant properties. Um, this is a mushroom or a fungus that grows on birch trees, um, typically in high, uh, either high altitudes or very northern regions, um, such as the northernmost United States into Canada. Here we have. Flamulina volutipes. This is the uh, enoki mushroom or the velvet foot, velvet shank mushroom. Um, typically, you'll see these in the stores as long, white, stringy mushrooms, um, and that's due to the fact that they're grown at with high CO2 for long, elongated stems, and also they're grown in the dark um, so that they never get any pigmentation and they completely stay white. Um, when you find them in the wild, um, they're going to be uh, brown capped um, with a brown stem. Uh, typically a very short stem and these are a delicious edible mushroom um, can be commonly misidentified uh, um, with the common look-alike which is the deadly gallerina um, was another little uh, brown mushroom this mushroom will have uh, the enoki the flemulina volutipes will have a white spore print um, so we're going to be going over how to take spore prints and spore prints are a great way um, to aid in identifying mushrooms Um, on the left here we have Ganoderm Matsuge. This is a reishi mushroom that grows on hemlock trees. Um, there are a variety of different reishi mushrooms that grow all around the United States. Um, and typically they have a similar appearance. Um, we mostly identify them by what they're growing on or the color, um, if they have a stem or if they don't have a stem, uh, these kinds of things. Um, on the right we actually have a cultivated uh, Ganoderma lingzhu. Uh, this is an Asian variety of uh, reishi with a yellow pore surface. Um, in this method of cultivation, the grower actually will inoculate a log by drilling holes into the log and introducing a mushroom culture into the holes um, and then burying uh, those logs um, in, a, in a ditch with rocks on the bottom for drainage and then covering it with soil and the mushrooms will actually grow right up through the soil. Uh, here we have the chanterelle. This is a mushroom that isn't uh, cultivated. This is a mycorrhizal fungus, typically in association with oak trees where I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, delicious, edible mushroom, um, and it grows during the summer. Um, here on the left, we can see uh, chanterelle with a somatic mutation. And on the right, we have a cantharellus aplichinensis. Um, so just in Pennsylvania alone, I found uh, over 10 species of, of cantharellus or chanterelle. Um, we have our golden type chanterelles and then we also have our craterellus um, which tend to be black. Um, on this next slide we have a relative 
of the uh, chanterelles, and this is the hiddenellum, or hiddenum, uh, not hiddenellum. These are hiddenum mushrooms, um, also commonly known as uh, hedgehog mushrooms. So similar to chanterelles, very tasty, very delicious mushrooms, um, and these mushrooms have teeth on the bottom. Chanterelles uh, have false gills. They look like gills, but they're not true gills. Um, they are more like wrinkles um, than they are gills. Um, so the hiddenum have teeth um, and otherwise look very similar to chanterelles and typically a little bit more hardy. Uh, here we have craterellus venosus on the left and on the right we have the commonly uh, seen craterellus um, craterellus phallax, um, which is our common uh, black trumpet mushroom. These are mushrooms of a similar quality as truffles, very aromatic, super delicious, high value gourmet mushroom, um, which are also mycorrhizal and can be found in similar areas where you'll find chanterelles growing around oak trees. Um, here we have another fungus, uh, another mycorrhizal fungus, a bolete. Um, this is porcini, uh, beautiful porcini. This is a Colorado variety known as uh, Boletus rubriceps. Um, so super delicious mushroom, um, also known as the king bolete. Uh, very tasty, has a similar f uh, flavor like bacon. Um, so a very highly sought after mushroom, high value mushroom. Um, there aren't very many, there aren't really any um, cases of people cultivating boletes. There has been a couple uh, cultivated boletes, but not at any scale. Uh, here we have a large flush of the chicken of the woods just to show um, that sometimes you can get up to 100 pounds of, of mushrooms on a single tree. Um, this I call a shelfie um, because these are shelf mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms that grow on the side of the trees are typically called shelf mushrooms. Sometimes these mushrooms are called the sulfur shelf, um, but that's just for fun. Um, so here we have the maitake growing underneath the oak trees typically. Um, September through November we'll find these mushrooms um, and they grow in incredible abundance. They're one of the easiest mushrooms to find a large amount of um, in the northeast and mid-Atlantic. And you can see how large these mushrooms are. Um, this was a four-hour trip with one of my friends. Um, four hours in and out of the forest and we found over 100 pounds of these mushrooms. So definitely easy to find a large amount of these mushrooms. Um, here we have a nativized shiitake or naturalized shiitake. Um, shiitake is an Asian mushroom, um, but due to the mass amount of cultivation in the United States, we have seen this mushroom go rogue, so to speak, um, and begin growing in the wild. So this was in Fairview, North Carolina, uh, where one tree produced an abundance of wild shiitake or naturalized shiitake mushrooms. Uh, this is a lobster mushroom. This is a, another parasitic fungus um, that's growing on a mushroom. So uh, lobster mushroom is a uh, hypomyces um, that grows on rusula mushrooms and lactarius mushrooms. Super delicious. Turns a, a bland mushroom like the rusula or lact uh, lactarius that it grows on into a very delicious gourmet edible. Um, here we have truffles. These aren't wild truffles. Well, these are Italian uh, or European wild truffles. In North America, we have um, pecan truffles. Uh, we have Oregon white truffles, and we have Oregon black truffles. Even though they're called Oregon white and Oregon black, they do grow in Washington State as well and in Northern California. Um, these are mycorrhizal type fungus that grow underground uh, around the root zone of trees, and typically you'll need um, an animal to help you find them, typically a dog or a pig. More people are switching over to dogs um, as pigs will like to eat the truffles and dogs will typically just find the truffles for you um, for a treat um, and they don't have really much desire to eat the mushroom. Um, here we have morels. These are burn morels so we find an abundance of these um, in where there's been forest fires in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we don't really get burn morels on the east coast. Um, this is either Morcella importuna or Morcella uh, rufobrunia. Um, there are landscape morels that can be cultivated in wood chips um, and in encouraged to fruit with uh, ash uh, from fires. 
Um, here we have the Eastern Porcini Bolitus Separans. Um, we also have Bolitus Chippewanensis, uh, which would be considered the Eastern Porcinis. Um, there are a variety of other mushrooms considered East Coast Porcini um, that I'm just not familiar with off the top of my head. Um, here we have uh, Lactarius, known as the Candy Cap Mushroom. This is a mushroom that smells like maple syrup when dried. Um, delicious uh, gourmet mushroom uh, utilized in desserts. And uh, I'll finish it off with this one, which is a Sarcodon imbricatus. Um, it's also known as Hawk's Wing. Delicious mushroom I found in North Carolina and also in Colorado. Um, so it has a large distribution. This is a mushroom with teeth underneath the cap, um, similar to the hedgehog mushrooms. Um, so there are an incredible abundance of mushrooms that grow across North America, incredible amount of edible mushrooms, toxic mushrooms, all of them have their place, all of them have interesting properties um, and should be researched. There's plenty of things that we can still discover uh, with wild mushrooms. Um, so oh, I, I thought that was over. Um, here we actually have a lion's mane uh, mushroom. Um, this is Heresium arenaceus. They can get fairly large um, and this one grows up in the crook of a tree where I actually have to pull my car up and grab a large stick to poke it down. This mushroom has averaged anywhere between 8 and 12 pounds. Um, sometimes you'll find them very small and rarely you will find them large like this. Um, this is Heresium americanum, a uh, beautiful uh, Heresium species. Lots of different Heresium mushrooms containing uh, neurological regenerative properties and nerve growth uh, properties. Um, so beautiful mushroom and it's great for your brain. Um, and here we have Bluet. Um, we're actually going to clone some Bluet and do some uh, spore prints with Bluet mushrooms um, in these videos so definitely stay tuned for that. Purple mushroom with a, per a pinkish white spore print. If you find a purple mushroom with a brown spore print that'll probably be Cordonarius and that's something you shouldn't eat. Um, these bluets are a delicious edible that grows on leaf litter, um, and you can eat these. Alright guys, so now we're going to go over um, cloning mushrooms in our clean space. Um, so this could be your glove box, this could be an area you cleaned in your house, um, and we're going to be working with Some petri dishes. Uh, so we have some petri dishes here. These are with coconut water agar. It's just one liter of coconut water to 25 grams of agar makes a nice uh, mushroom culturing uh, substrate. So we're going to get into this here. Um, first thing I'm going to do is grab a paper towel, set this down uh, right in front of me. I'm going to spray this paper towel down with alcohol. 70% uh, isopropyl and now I'm going to take my wild mushroom um, or this could be a mushroom you got at the store um, typically I'm cloning wild mushrooms um, and this is a bluet mushroom so this is a mushroom that we went over in the uh, mushroom identification you can see it's purple um, it has white spores whitish pink spores um, but you can see this mushroom is really dirty, so I want to separate all these other potential organisms that are growing in the dirt on this, or any other bacteria that might be on the outside of this. Um, so what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to spray the outside of this mushroom uh, with some isopropyl alcohol. Um, for smaller mushrooms, um, you don't you want to be kind of careful with how much alcohol you spray on it because it'll soak through, potentially kill off some of the cells in the inside. So here I have my handy dandy scalpel. I'm gonna go ahead and sterilize my scalpel with the back disintegrator. Um, you can utilize a uh, lighter uh, butane torch, uh, something of that nature to sterilize your scalpel. So I'm breaking my mushroom open and you'll notice in the inside um, there is clean tissue. If there's bug damage, if there's little bug holes, um, you're gonna wanna stay away from those because those can potentially uh, have bacteria or mold spores and things like that in there. So I'm going to take my agar dish, keep it in front of my dirty mushrooms. Um, I have my hot scalpel, 
you can see there's some steam coming off from something that was previously on there. Um, and this is right after you take it out of the back of the incinerator or right after you hit it with the lighter. You're going to open your dish. Every time you open your dish, you're going to want to keep the lid over it to keep anything from falling in there kind of add added protection. So I'm going to take my hot scalpel and I'm going to cool it down inside of the agar so that I don't kill uh, my mushroom tissue when I go in to work with it. So I'm going to take my mushroom here and I'm going to cut a tiny little piece of the inner tissue right out of there put it on the end of my scalpel you can see that right there um, and I'm going to stick it on one side of my petri dish um, because these petri dishes are a decent size I can stick two pieces of tissue culture in there um, that way if one of them gets contaminated I can use the mycelium from another one um, and uh, this uh, saves my petri dishes so I don't have to buy a bunch more all the time. So I'm going to go for another piece here. I'm going to get right in there and take out a little piece of tissue and then stick that on the other end of my petri dish. I'm going to sterilize my tool once more and then set it off to the side. All throughout this, I've been spraying my hands with isopropyl alcohol just to make sure that these gloves stay clean. Um, now that I have my tissue culture, I'm gonna go ahead and fold this up. If you're in your lab or in your clean space, you don't want dirty mushrooms hanging around. I'm gonna spray this, spit this spot down. I'm gonna take my paper towel here and I'm gonna wipe towards me. I never wipe around. I don't wanna wipe bacteria around. Um, over here I have some parafilm, you can see parafilm, um, this is a wax film used in laboratories and I'm going to rip a little piece of that off here, I'm going to use this piece of this parafilm, uh, the side that was touching the paper is the clean side so that's the side I'm going to touch to my dish and I'm just going to wrap the outside of the dish with this parafilm um, to prevent anything from going out, um, kind of act as an air filter for air that might go in and out of the dish. Now that I have that all sealed up, I'm going to go ahead and write what this is. So this is a Bluet clone and the date. I'll then set this aside to incubate. Um, it needs to just stay about room temperature and out of direct sunlight so that it doesn't dry up. So here you can see um, a clone that I took last week of a SRA, that is Trafaria rugoso annulata. Um, FP stands for fungi perfecti. Um, so I originally got the culture from fungi perfecti, I grew it in my yard, um, and then I, grew, I got the mushrooms and I cloned them. Um, so I took the little piece of tissue and I did three for a plate and you can see this beautiful white mycelium growing in there that I can then open this up cut a little piece of that tissue out, um, put it into some sterile grains, put it into another petri dish, or put it into a liquid culture, um, which is basically just a sterile sugar broth um, that I mix every day once I put a culture in. You can see there's mycelium floating around in there, um, which can be sucked up with a syringe um, and utilized to inoculate uh, grains or um, uh, more liquid culture or whatever it is that you're interested in uh, growing your material on. Um, so, hope that was helpful for you guys. Um, and that's how you clone a mushroom onto agar.